Welcome to Tualatin, crossroads of the Ice Age flood. Outside, Mother Nature is shouting out to all of us that there is a story. First, we hope to show you how these Ice Age floods fashioned the area, not only locally, but then also all over the Pacific Northwest, 16,000 square miles in the area. And then secondly, what lived on the land? What were the animals and the plants that lived here during the time of the Ice Age floods until now? And then thirdly, the Native Americans. What were they like initially right after the floods, but then all the way to today and how they have lived off of the land. The Missoula floods carved our landscape, shaping our history, our use of the land, our daily lives together, and even our vision of the future. The Ice Age Flood National Geologic Trail of the U.S. Park Service will introduce thousands to the story of the floods. Tualatin, an Ice Age Flood destination, and uniquely placed jewel along the trail already has many features and displays to help others understand and appreciate these mighty cataclysms. Join us as we tell the story of this incredible history here in Tualatin in the south part of Portland. This whole story of the Ice Age floods is one of the greatest geologic stories in history in North America. A professor called J. Harlan Bretz, who was a professor starting out at the University of Washington, would take his students to do work in eastern Washington. He would see these great valleys, but no water in them. They looked like they were formed by a large flood. He would also find huge waterfalls, but there's no water there today, and great coolies like the Grand Coulee or the Moses Coulee or Seven Devils Coulee. He called it the Channeled Scablands. And he said, wow, this had to have been formed by a large flood. And so in 1923, he published a paper. He called it the Spokane Flood. This was not good for him because he went against the origin of landscapes by geologists of the day because landscapes were formed slowly over a long period of time not catastrophically. And he was saying a big, huge flood came in. And secondly, they said, hey, where'd the water come from? He said, well, I don't know, maybe from the glaciers, but he didn't have a source. And so between 1923 and 1940, the geologists of the day were attacking Brett's and his idea of this Spokane flood over and over and over again. But in 1940, at the meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Seattle, Washington, a guy named J.T. Pardee presented a paper about a old glacial lake called Lake Missoula. If you go to Camas Prairie, which is between that old lake and Spokane, you can see these incredible ripples that are five miles long, 50 feet high, one after another after another. Sure looks like to me that a large flood came through this particular area. He basically said, I have found the source for the water for Brett's flood. Then in the next 15 to 20 years, people said, whoa, Brett's may be right. And all those geologists have said, no, you're wrong. Eventually that took over. And in 1967, Bretz published a paper about the Missoula flood. Bretz stuck to his guns. If you got good data, stick to it. Even though you're going against every geologist of the day because you had broken uniformitarianism, that was very important. Then a guy named Richard Waite was out in Tushy, Washington, having lunch next to a canyon we call Burlingame Canyon. And he saw these different layers of sediments. And he said, whoa, there's sand on the bottom, silt on the top. They're what we call a graded bed. We call them rhythmites today. He counted them up. There were 40 of them. He said, maybe we had 40 floods instead of one flood. As we know today, catastrophic events are very, very common. In the end, Brett's lived to be 98 years old. He outlived every detractor that said that he was wrong. And so we tell our students, today, stick to your guns if you got good data. The ice dam came down in the Ponderay Valley, dammed up the Clark Fork River, which is draining western Montana. The size of that dam was three space needles, one on top of another, 1,700 feet from the bottom to the top. That was a lot of ice. It eventually broke up, and then once it did, the computer models say three to four days to break up. If you take all the flows of all of the rivers uh, in the world, add them up in cubic meters per second, 
and multiply by 10, that is the flow, 10 to the 18th meters per second. They are so big and they do a huge amount of geologic work in a short period of time. When the Missoula floodwaters came out of the Columbia River Gorge, they spread out to about a 200 mile alluvial fan or delta, dropping tons of rocks and gravel and sand. The largest rocks towards the mouth of the gorge and then the smaller as it went into Portland and through Portland, then down through Lake Oswego and through Oregon City, where it filled the Tualatin Valley and the Willamette Valley. These floodwaters followed the coulees, especially the Grand Coulee, which had a giant waterfall flow through the middle. Remnants of the erosion can be seen today at Dry Falls State Park in Washington. As the waters flowed south, they re-entered the Columbia River at a constriction called Wallula Gap on what is now the Oregon-Washington border. The water ponding upstream of Wallula Gap formed a lake that reached the Yakima and Walla Walla Valleys. The floodwaters then passed through that gap and followed the Columbia River through the Columbia Gorge, widening and deepening it as it flowed up to depths of 700 feet. Evidence of this is seen by gravel deposits on the slopes. The water scoured away an ancient volcano in the gorge, leaving its core. Today, it is known as Beacon Rock. Near the mouth of the gorge, the water scoured the slopes up to 600 feet on the north side of Cape Horn and the south side at Crown Point. Because the soil was so saturated, a landslide caused a large block of Crown Point to drop during the last flood and deposited it upright at the bottom of the slope on the edge of the Columbia River. Today we call it Rooster Rock. The floodwaters entered the Portland Basin at velocities of 65 to 80 miles per hour, carrying abundant debris. When it came into Portland, it hit two volcanoes, Rocky Butte and Prune Hill. And then the areas in back of it uh, created huge depositions that we call pendant bars of sediments. We call it Alameda Ridge in Portland. In Washington and Vancouver, we call it the Mill Plain pendant bar that you have got. And in fact, the whole topography of Portland and Vancouver is all a result of the Missoula floods. Then down in the Portland area, it flowed through what is now Lake Oswego, gouging another linear lake. If you look at it from the map, you'll see it's a long, narrow lake that was actually scoured by these floodwaters flowing through at high speeds. Willamette Falls is the second largest by volume waterfall in the United States second only to Niagara. It is extremely important in the settlement of the West. Before the settlement of the West, the floods flowed through Portland and then through places like the Oregon City Gap where it sped up again and eroded flat scab lands on each side of the Willamette River near Willamette Falls. The one on the Oregon City side is called Kanema. It is a public area called the Kanema Scablands. And then on the west side at West Lynn, behind the West Lynn High School, is Kamasia or Kamasia, which is a scabland. The floodwaters entered the Portland Basin at velocities of 65 to 80 miles per hour, carrying abundant debris. As the floodwaters filled the Portland Basin, some waters continued northward into the Columbia Channel towards the ocean. Some entered and filled up the Tualatin Valley through what is now Lake Oswego and Tualatin. And some filled the Willamette Valley via the Willamette River that runs between what is now today Oregon City and West Lynn. These valleys filled up to an elevation of about 400 feet in the first flood. Floods that came later had successively less volumes. The waters left the Tualatin Valley to flow into the ocean through the Willamette Valley via the Tualatin River Valley through Tualatin, depositing large current ripples east of Tualatin. These ripples today can be seen at the Tonkin Scablands next to Tualatin and a gap near Gaston in the west of the valley. Coffee Lake is a depression in the Tonkin Scablands, carved by extreme erosion into the bedrock from fast-moving waters. 
the water eventually left the Willamette Valley via Willamette Falls, which is now Oregon City, and then to Portland to the Columbia River. When all of the valleys were filled up to 400 feet above sea level, it started flowing back out. On the way out, it created different things than it had created on the way in. And one very large thing it made was Willamette Falls. This falls was created as a receding waterfall. In the Portland area, it sheared off a nice flat platform to build downtown Portland. We follow the I-84, the Banfield Freeway, which is actually sort of a serpentine flow because it actually flowed around Rocky Butte and then flowed slightly to the north to avoid Mount Tabor down into downtown Portland. On the west end of the flood channel that flowed around Rocky Butte, we call it Sullivan's Gulch. Sullivan was a farmer who homesteaded that area in the 1800s. Now it has a freeway and the light rail track as well as a regular railroad track. It's 60 feet deep today and it actually has been filled in some since the settlers were first here. The mouth of the Columbia River was actually 50 to 100 miles west of where it is now, with a lot of the rocks from uh, all the way from Montana, all the way down through the gorge, out into the Pacific Ocean. As far as Northern California, we find those sediments down at the Mendocino Trough off of Northern California. It left so much sand and gravel at the mouth of the Columbia River that it was actually a navigation hazard and was considered the deadliest river crossing in the world for a while. Since the water was 200 to 400 feet lower during the Ice Age, the mouth of the Columbia was actually about 50 miles or more out to sea. How do we know how far these floods extended? They came into the Portland area and they went all the way to Eugene. But how were we able to tell that? Erratics, which are rocks that do not have a local source, were found. Ira Allison, many years ago, went and located and mapped the erratics that were in the Willamette Valley. Many of them were at the 400-foot elevation. Behind me are granite erratics. They used to be called glacial erratics, but we didn't have glaciers down here. They came in on icebergs. When the ice dam broke, it had incorporated into the ice rocks from the northern Rockies, like granite, feldspar, and argillite. So when we find those, we know that those are erratics. The most interesting of our erratics. It is the Willamette meteorite, which is 15 and a half tons of nickel iron. We believe that the Willamette meteorite landed on the ice dam up in Canada and was floated down to this area in West Lynn. There's no crater where the meteorite landed, and there were some other granite erratics found with it. Our largest erratic in Oregon is called the Bellevue Erratic, and it is at the Erratic Rock Natural Site between McMinnville and Sheridan on Highway 18. It is close to 100 tons of argillite, a metamorphosed mudstone. One of the prominent features about the Ice Age is how it impacted animal migrations, causing many animals to move south. As the Ice Age ended, Many of these animals were impacted by the dramatic climate change. Several species went extinct, such as mammoths and mastodons. In the Willamette Valley, as the floodwaters came and went, animals would move into the area but could not be sustained. In recent years, extinct animal remains have been found throughout the valley, including a mastodon in Tualatin. Rumors were that they found one in 1846 south of the Fred Meyer store, that they had found the, the tusk. And they dug up the mastodon, half a skeleton of it. When I heard that story, it got me interested. 
I went to Portland State College and one day I walked out of the cafeteria and here were these bones displayed in a display case. And the professor said, well, you know, we don't have room for those bones. Do you want them? For some reason, I felt like, yeah, I'll take them. This is the site in Tualatin where the Tualatin mastodon bones were found. It was just a garden and the uh, marshal was digging an irrigation ditch for the Thompson house that was along the street. When he discovered the mastodon molar, told John George about it, and when George was a senior at Portland State, he decided to dig it up to get a uh, A on his thesis. There's an opportunity that is unique to the whole state of Oregon and maybe the area to tell the story of the Ice Age to the point that our younger generation can understand them. I lived here all my life and didn't know until maybe 20, 30 years ago what, what the story is. This discovery also inspired a land developer to include a model of the Mastodon in the new shopping center in Tualatin and facilitated a new Tualatin River Greenway Trail behind the shopping center. It starts just east of the uh, Tualatin Library behind the stores known as Cabela's, two miles now, and then if we connect to the Willamette Falls, it's gonna be 12, 15 miles. Finding fossils from the Ice Age has inspired many locals to go hunting for more. I grew up in this area, McMinnville, and spent my whole life in the valley here. When I was about 12 years old, I was playing down on the Yamhill River outside of McMinnville and came home with a strange looking rock. That was the start of a lifelong obsession of mine with the Pleistocene fossils in our local area. These floodwaters covered the Willamette Valley at this location to a depth of about 300 feet higher than we are right now. Rivers would all cut their way back through and braid across this large flat valley and what we're seeing is uh, evidence of that down here. The megafauna came back, this would have been like an American Serengeti. This section of the river is real shallow and broad. It acts as a fossil trap for us with all of these trees, branches and snags through here. We'll find a lot of small fossils in here and we work our way upstream through this area and mark every one that we have. Quartzite, it's a glacial erratic. That one came all the way from the Rocky Mountains on an iceberg, melted off of the iceberg, dropped to the ground, and was here for you to find. Look at that. What is it? It's part of a mammoth. That's the first time anybody's ever seen or touched that. Somewhere right along here, we've got a mammoth, or a mastodon wearing out of the bank, and we've been picking up pieces of him for 20 some years. And we found part of his pelvis, part of his skull, part of his jaw, quite a few pieces of his tusk. First uh, trip down here this summer, we found that articulating condyle right in here. So they can be anywhere from midstream out there where we've got a snorkel or, or uh, scuba to clear up. We have found uh, pieces of mammoth actually embedded in that sand. This case contains the a uh, partial skull of a Colombian mammoth that we excavated in McMinnville. Every bone that we find tells us something about the environment, tells us about what was going on. The next fossil case down here has the remains of a giant ground sloth. We had ground sloths in the Willamette Valley that would stand about six to seven feet high at the shoulders. We recovered the femur of a Harlan's ground sloth, skull fragments, this is a mandibular section, part of the jawbone, vertebra, almost an entire set of teeth. We have a rich history of many, many, many different types of animals. Many of them are extinct in our own backyard. All you've got to do is look for it. Another local hotspot for finding Ice Age fossils has been at the Woodburn High School, a few miles south of Tualatin. The first find of these bones were found by accident by utility workers. After the initial find, local scientists descended on the property to find out more about this great location. There were some different 
scientists, paleontologists, archaeologists from Oregon State University and the Institute for Archaeological Studies were here and they had discovered an ancient bog that was on the Woodburn High School campus. I was pretty excited about joining in on that because I was a new teacher and I wanted to be able to have something you know, authentic for kids to be able to experience. And we find all sorts of animals and plants that existed here in Woodburn at that time. Behind me, you can see obviously is one of the bigger critters that we've uncovered. There were a lot of bison that were walking and roaming around the Willamette Valley as the ice age was ending. There aren't any more now, they're gone. But this was probably one of the last of the few that remained in the valley before they all went extinct. And this was all found by high school kids in Woodburn. We found bones of muskrats, turtles, frogs, ducks, beaver, and then lots of different plants that lived here. Fascinating about the Woodburn area, it was wetter than it is today, which if you can imagine that, the low-lying areas were bogs, were marshes, were lots of standing water. And it created ecosystems again where animals came in. The floods came in, they devastated the area, but they didn't kill all the animals. They were animals that were up on higher levels, and I'm sure some of these animals were able to get out of the way of the, of the incoming water. And so they survived, and when the waters receded, they moved back in and repopulated the area and continued their existence. This right here is the scapula that goes with this humerus, so that would have sat right there on top of that humerus. And so as we've done these, these bones, we've, we've, we've realized we had a pretty big bison that died here in Woodburn. We're being told that this might be the largest bison skeleton that's ever been found. These are the sizes of the bones that we're finding. Some are very large and some are extremely small. This is where the digs are done in Woodburn. We dig down here every year. About 15 feet below where I'm standing right now are the Missoula flood deposits, that gray silty layer. And then above them are all those other layers, the layer with the bones that was representing a ponding area. And right above that is the boggy area. And above that is the foresty area. And then above that is clay. From a tribal perspective, we say that we've been here in Western Oregon since time immemorial, or a time that no one can remember. What's important about that when we're trying to understand how long people have been here in the Willamette Valley or Western Oregon is that we as Native people remember events that happened a really long time ago. We have stories of Missoula floods, we have stories of people out here at volcanoes, during tsunamis that have been recorded through, you know, various means and we know we were here before that. Uh, the people that were here were hunting the megafauna of the late Pleistocene. They were shooting camels, the ancient horse that went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene. In other words, environmental conditions were markedly different at the time of the Missoula floods. The oral histories that speak to the floods um, the earliest written down version of those uh, was told by a man named William Hartless, a Mary's River Kalapuya man. And in his stories that he told about the floods, he talks about how the waters rose slow enough that people could run out in front of them. Also talked about areas of land that were out of the floods themselves and where people actually sought refuge during the floods. And there's even reference about uh, traveling back and forth across the lake in canoes to get to their family that had been separated during the flood event. Tribal groups uh, prior to settlement interacted in all the ways that people have across the world. They intermarried, they warred with each other, they <laughs> celebrated, they worked things out. There's no one way. Life, life was lived at you know, a grand scale. The Kalapuyans had a very wild agrarian society. In the summer times, they would move around to various encampments, sometimes in their canoes, sometimes walking across the land to go to various fields where they knew they had, they had different root crops. People often had winter villages where their storehouses, where they brought goods back to, um, and then they had gathering where they would regularly or routinely go to the same place every year, every three years, five years. They would not only go themselves, but they would often meet up with tribal people from other places. Willamette Falls was the crossroads of Western Oregon. 
It was the most important fishery in the region. The Clackamas people there had lots and lots of salmon that they had either smoked or dried. Those kind of things would be traded. They would trade, you know, lots of camas that was pre-cooked for this pre-prepared salmon that you could just eat. One of the greatest gifts that the Creator gave us as tribal people um, is Tamanawas, uh, which is also known today as the Willamette Meteorite. It was a very special object, and it's very likely that it came in on the bottom of an iceberg during the Missoula floods. And when that iceberg melted, that meteorite landed on a hillside between Westland and Lake Oswego. For generations, our people worshiped, celebrated, prayed at Tamanoas. As an important place, it's the perfect blending of all elements, right? It's made of the sky, the earth, fire, and water actually collects in the cupules of the meteorite. The Molalas have, re have stories of using the meteorite for gathering sort of hunting power, and they would dip their sort of arrows in, in the waters that collected in, in the, the pits in the, in the meteor, and they would get hunting power. And so the tribes nowadays do the same thing. Grand Ron goes to American History Museum in New York City and every other year now and talks to it and does a ceremony and, uh, and, and we believe that um, it listens to us because it's used to our you know original language and stuff. Our stories are not just ones of science but also ones of description and cast our characters within them like Coyote and Meadowlark and all of these other protagonists that teach us about the ways of things and how the world works. So when people come here to visit our homelands, what I want them to see is I want them to see the richness in our stories, the way that we understand the landscape itself, not just through science, but also through our culture, through our practices and our beliefs. With the impact of fossils, ancient cultures, and water impacting the Tualatin region, the local government saw an opportunity to showcase the area for those wanting to find out more. Tualatin's fortunate to have a history with uh, Ice Age floods and uh, megafauna occurring right in this area. They showed up in the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Later on, the Ice Age Floods National Geologic Trail was enacted by Congress. Tualatin saw the opportunity to partner with the Foundation and the uh, National Park Service and others. Tualatin may be a destination location while people were traveling and exploring the Ice Age floods in the Willamette Valley. We've got this Greenway Trail, we've got Ibac Park with a play area that interprets the floods and other history megafauna. We've got the Tualatin Historical Society. We've got the Tualatin Public Library. We have created exhibits and programs and features. This Tualatin River Greenway Trail is a destination for families. They uh, like the natural beauty of the area and they are mesmerized by the natural and cultural interpretive facilities. There is this section of the path that has colored concrete and embedded glass and that helps tell the story of then there are replicas of megafauna. Tualatin is at the crossroads of the Ice Age floods, and we're very happy to be a stop on the Ice Age floods National Geologic Trail, where people can see some of the things that were impacted by the floods, including local landforms and some of the animals that lived during that time period. I think that Tualatin Library is the only library in the nation that has a mastodon skeleton as part of it. The skeleton was dug up less than a mile from the library here in our town. If you're exploring the Ice Age Floods Trail, you're driving past Tualatin, you'll want to stop in Tualatin. It's a beautiful community, a great place to stretch your legs and let your kids explore, whether it's at a, at a park or on this Greenway Trail or at the Heritage Center. There's a lot of information about the Ice Age floods and the Pleistocene megafauna of the Willamette Valley and the Tualatin Valley. As awareness and impact of the Ice Age flood has grown, enthusiasts and scientists have joined forces. They created an unofficial nonprofit to promote the incredible geologic features from Eastern Washington to the bottom of the Willamette Valley in Oregon. The Ice Age Floods Institute was formed by some scientists who thought this was such a large, amazing story, it needed to be told to the public. So they formed the Ice Age Floods Institute and presented to Congress the idea of making a trail so that people could follow the Ice Age Floods. 
It was actually signed into law in 2009 and is now being implemented. Eventually, we will have kiosks and visitor centers all along the way, and Tualatin is one of the first spots on the National Geologic Trail. It will just use existing displays or maybe rest centers where they could put up a kiosk telling people about these floods. There's an opportunity that is unique to the whole state of Oregon and maybe the area. We want to build a foundation interpretive center to go along with the national parks to tell the story of the Ice Age to the point that our younger generation can understand them. That is our vision and we are looking for partners to help us have our vision come true. Right now, we are only at the Toilet Library, but we hope to have our own building. Help us to reach thousands of people who will be coming through in the future to learn the story here.